We appreciate you guys. Um, you know, Randy's not the only one that's uh, been under the weather this week. I, I got sick earlier than the week, and I was wondering, you know, our, our new youth pastor's coming and all that, and Connie said, well, you better get tested. It was, a, it was a chore getting tested this week. I had some of the symptoms, but I finally did get tested. Praise God, it was negative. Um, and I'm glad I'm here. But you pray for me today, because uh, uh, I've, I've been having spells of coughing. I've been having all kinds of sinus stuff. I had stopped taking my uh, sinus medicine, and I started it back again. So it's, it's, it's helping, and it's kicked in. But you know, that old scratchy throat's there. But God has a word for all of us today. Rewards, uh, not judgment. That's what this passage is about. Um, today, we're going to see, we're going to learn or be reminded of from the faith of Father Abraham. You kids remember a few years ago, <laughs> maybe it's way, way long time ago, I don't know, but there's this song, you know, Father Abraham had many sons. Y'all remember that? That's what the message is about today, the faith of our father Abraham, so that, of course, the real reason for that is so that we'll all fall more in love with our Heavenly Father uh, as we trust in Jesus. Romans chapter 4 shows us how Abraham is an example of faith in action. Somebody say faith in action. Amen. That's what we're talking about today. Faith isn't passive. You know, faith isn't just something that's, faith has action to it. And uh, if the patriarch Abraham, uh, the patriarch of the Jewish people was justified by faith and not by works or by circumcision or any uh, other sign, then no one can be saved by just trying to do good. You see, that's, that's the lie of the enemy today. You try to witness or share your faith with people. A lot of people, you know, don't even, you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm doing, no, that's, that's not what the Bible says. We've already preached on Romans 3.23, haven't we? <laughs> All, and I think that means everybody, <laughs> have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Now, this passage um, Abraham was justified by faith and not by keeping the law. This is not an easy passage to understand because uh, it's a little bit compl complex if you uh, look at what I read a, a moment ago. He's, he's just, in the verses before this, has been talking about circumcision and uncircumcision and when it was the faith that, that Abraham was justified. And the issue is, you know, circumcision was the sign of the covenant of God with his people Israel. It was a sign. It was something that they did to... It was, it was an action of their faith and trust in God, and so that's why they followed that. But what he says in these verses, as we looked at last Sunday, and when I preached that 15-minute sermon, how about that, folks? <laughs> now, none of y'all believed that when I told you when it was just starting, it was, ice was coming down and snow was coming down, and people kept telling me, Pastor, Pastor. And uh, Brother Joe, only, we only sang a couple of verses, and, and I preached a 15-minute sermon. Well... Hold on to your seats. It's probably not going to be 15 minutes this morning. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot here. There's, this is a very complex passage. He says in verse 13, For the promise that he, Abraham, would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He, what's, what's happening here is there's this either-or argument. Uh, he's... Uh, the writer, Paul, uh, at this point in the book of Romans, he's contrasting, he, he's, he wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's contrasting between the law and faith and between inheriting the world and inheriting uh, God's uh, judgment. As I said in verses 9 through 12, he argues against circumcision as the way of salvation. It was only a sign. It was only a mark of, of God's people. Uh, but that's not how they were saved. And so uh, he's talking about a chronological or histo uh, histori historical argument. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray for me. I knew it was going to happen. <coughs> this argument, he's saying, you know, Abraham... <coughs> I'm going to have 
to taper it down. So y'all, y'all just uh, bear with me. He says that Abraham was justified 14 years before circumcision was ever given as a sign. So instead of arguing from history, it shows us the holes in trying to live by the law and the inevitable result. Because if we try to keep the, folks, you can't keep the Ten, the ten Commandments are there. They're, they're God's law. But that's not the way we're saved. None of us can do that. Uh, the inevitable result of trying to live by the law is to receive God's judgment. You see, the, the promise didn't come through performance, but it came through faith. Notice it says that Abraham was an heir, H-E-I-R, of the world. What's he saying here? Well, you remember, don't you? God's promise to Abraham back in Genesis. Abraham received at least four different parts of that, that promise. People, uh, Genesis 13, 16, Genesis 15, 5. He said, I'm, you're going you're gonna to be the father of many. You can read it up there because my voice is about gone. Yeah, you can just read those verses. But that's what's there. He, his first, the first part of his promise was people. God was going to give him a people. The second thing was land, uh, Genesis 15, 18 to 21. God gave them the promised land. And of course, you know they were dispersed. Actually, they've been dispersed two or three times throughout history. We were talking about that in Sunday school today, weren't we, Brother David? And most people didn't think that there would ever be a Jewish nation again because they were dispersed all over the world. But what happened in 1948? Some of y'all were, that was a little bit before my time. Some of y'all were alive during that time. In 1948, God, I believe it was God, <laughs> of course the United Nations and all that did it, but it was God. But the nation of Israel now exists. God promised to Abraham a land. By the way, they've never possessed all, all of that <laughs> that God promised him. But it's coming <laughs> when Jesus comes back <laughs> during the thousand years reign. Uh, it's going to be there. He also pr promised in Genesis, a verse very familiar to us, Genesis 12, 3, a blessing. He said, I'm, uh, I'm going to bless you and you're going to be a blessing. He was talking about salvation for all people. And then, of course, a redeemer. Galatians 3, uh, verse 8 and verse 16. And so there were four parts of this promise that God gave to Abraham but notice that it happened before he was ever circumcised so it's, it doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, what we do is what he's trying to say is our salvation is not based on keeping the law or doing this or doing that or not doing this or, or not doing that and the word here for law by the way that he uses in these verses includes those things that we normally think about we must do in order to earn uh, God's blessing or acceptance. So the focus, the point today is, the focus should not be on our performance for God, but of our faith in the promises of God. So in one sentence, the sermon would be this. Here it is, Brother Chuck. When we focus our lives on faith we will inherit the world. But if we focus on performing, we're only going to inherit God's judgment. So focus on your faith. Focus on strengthening your faith, that God would grow your faith. That's what we're about here at TBC. We have four G's. Can you all remember any of them? What's the first G? Gather. You get the second one is grow. The third one is give. The last one's go. That's what we're about. Gathering, <clears throat> growing in the Lord and reaching others, giving of our, not just of our 
money, but our time and our, our gifts and, our, and then going, going with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so why, look, look at why he tells us that, that, that law living always loses. He says, verse 14, but if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, promise made no effect, because the law brings about wrath, or where there is no law, there is no transgression. Whenever we're wrapped up in trying to work for God by keeping a set of, of rules or standards, we will be exhausted in three ways. Notice the first way we're going to be ex exhausted. Our faith's going to be forfeited. He says, it's, it's no good. If we're saved by the law, faith, faith is empty when we try to get by on our own efforts. He uses the word useless. Our faith becomes useless. Faith and law, folks, are opposites. That's what he's doing here. When you choose one, you reject the other. It's not the fact that the law is not important. It is important. That's how we learn that we're sinners. Amen? Uh, the right a right relationship with God is either a gift to be received or it is a prize to be earned. Amen? And we know that it's a gift to be received. Do you trust your own abilities? Or you trust in God's accomplishments through Jesus? That's what we're about. That's the issue. It can't be both. So the first thing, if we, if we live, if, if we try to live according to the law, we forfeit our faith. The second thing is God's promises are undermined. He says that they're, they're worthless. It's actually, the word means permanently idle. You see, God's promises are always perforated when we try to do things in our own strength, folks. And you know, I, I learned that so well when we were on the mission field all those years. You know, they say pastors, Monday's the worst day for pastors because we all want to quit. <laughs> but on the mission field, every day is a Monday, sometimes. <laughs> Especially when we were trying to learn language. You ever tried to learn another language? I'll tell you, that's one of the most difficult things that missionaries do. After about six months, we were ready to give up. You know, we were living out in the middle of nowhere, and there's a rice field out there, and I told Connie one day, I said, you know, if, if, if a plane from America or somewhere could land out there in that rice field, I'd get on it and I'd go back home. But, you know, I knew God had called us. That's what kept us there. But the times that, that got rough was when I realized God convicted me. You, Sam, you can't do this in your own strength. Brother Kamen, uh, as our youth pastor, you can't do it in your own strength. I know you know that. You won't go anywhere until you trust in the Lord and trust in Him alone. Amen. The only way the promises of God are going to be fulfilled in your life and my life is through faith, through trusting in the Lord. The third thing that happens is judgment is awakened. Notice what he says there in that 15th verse. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there's no transfer. You see, <clears throat> if we try to live by the law... It ain't going to happen, folks. <laughs> uh, no one can keep God's law perfectly. Only Jesus did that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He fulfilled the law. You see, God's righteous wrath is upon those who just trust in themselves and trust in trying to, to do it themselves. It actually, the word there, wrath, we don't use that word anymore. You ever, you ever hear that word? Uh, originally, that was the title of my sermon. And I changed it, didn't I, Brother David? Uh, rewards, not wrath. But I changed it, rewards, not judgment, because that makes, I mean, that's the word people use. People don't use it. But that word wrath literally, literally means violent vengeance. It's, it's the idea of swelling that eventually bursts. Now, if you, if you have raised tomatoes, I know some of y'all raised tomatoes. I've raised tomatoes before. But in the, in the dead of summer, when your tomatoes are getting big and plump, you know what happens if you don't pick them 
and it comes a big rain, <laughs> what happens? It, 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 they burst. They, they split. They burst. This is the word for wrath in the Bible. You see, God is a patient. He's long-suffering, but there's some day, <laughs> some day that wrath is going to burst. It's, it, it's, you see, when we focus on faith, we will inherit the world, but if we focus on performing, we will only inherit God's judgment and God's wrath. So now we move to the good part. This is the good part. Why is faith, why does, if, if law living loses, why, why does faith, faith living win? Verses 16 and 17. Well, he says, we are not declared righteous by law living, but by living by faith. You see, Abraham's trust was not in what he possessed, but in what he was promised. He uses this faith, we believe. Faith, four times. The idea here, notice, notice how he expresses it here. Therefore it is of, verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all, all the seed, not only on those who are of the law, but of those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. The idea here, the literal word here is talking about drinking. Yeah. You see, when, when we, when you, here we go. When, when we drink something, we don't just look at it, do we? No. We don't just admire it. Oh, this is nice water here. We don't even just, you know, just uh, swirl it around. What do we do? We pour it into our mouths. And it goes down into our throats so that it becomes part of us. You see, that's what faith is. Jesus said this in John 7. Therefore, as it is written, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He was talking about belief. He was talking about faith. So if living by the law doesn't work, what happens when we drink in God's truth by faith? He mentions at least five things that happens. The first thing that happens is God's promises are personalized in our lives. When, in verse 16, we, we, we claim them by faith. Do you claim God? God's promises become personalized and activated when we appropriate them, you see? It's only by faith. You see, God is the ultimate promise keeper. He's, the, the Bible is full of promises. Literally, thousands of promises, Brother Joe, in the Bible. Are you claiming God's promise? God's promises are personalized when we try to live by faith. Listen to Psalm 145, verse 30, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, Lord, and your dominion endures through all generations. What a promise, brother. Listen to uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20. It says, For all the promises of God in him are what? Yes. And in him, amen, Colton, amen, to the glory of God through us. Amen? Amen. All God's promises in Jesus Christ are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God the Father. The first thing that happens when we, when we, when we live by faith is God's promises become personal to us. And I know Brother Cayman was saying he was praying the Lord would give him a, 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 a verse. You're still searching for that, aren't you? you know, you've already found it. Okay, praise God. He's going to share that with us. But um, the second thing that happens is grace is given. He said that it, that it might be of grace, verse 16. You see, living by the law leads to condemnation, but living by grace leads to commendation. There was an, I heard the story of an elderly woman who trusted Jesus Christ for salvation and uh, she was being teased and tormented by some of her non-Christian friends when she trusted in Christ. And, and they, they threw questions at her. They, they tried to 
to uh, get her to get mad and to argue and so forth. And, and uh, she would try to answer them to the best of her ability. And one day, a lady that she'd been witnessing to, who was a mean lady, came to her and said, well, what does, what does being saved by grace mean? God blessed her with a great answer, Brother Chuck. She said, well, Jesus stood in my shoes at Calvary, and now I'm standing in his. <laughs> That's what's saved by grace. Jesus stood in my, Jesus took my place on that cross. He took the judgment of God. He took all the wrath of God on my sin. He stood in my shoes, but now I'm standing in his. That's God's grace. That's a good answer. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The third thing that happens when we seek to live by faith is, is, is our salvation becomes sure or certain. You see, if you think that salvation is by works or something that you do, you can never be sure that you're truly saved because you will never know if you've done enough. <laughs> What's enough, well, brother? Joe? What's enough? Yeah, you, but you can be sure. The Bible is clear that it's all been done. As I said, you always hear me say this: the the Christian faith is not it's unlike any other. It's not a do religion. It's not something not a do and a don't. It's a done. Jesus has done it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Uh, certain. Second Samuel 23, verse 5. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant. Ordered in all things and secure. I like that. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it? Increase. You see, God has arranged it all, and because he has, salvation is secure. God's promises are personalized by faith, and they're guaranteed by his grace. A fourth thing that happens is God, uh, God offers salvation to everybody. Notice what he says there in verse 17, Brother B.J. God never intended for his people to keep his, this message to themselves. Let me say that again. God never intended for us to keep this message to ourselves. Amen. God is a global God. God blessed Abraham so that he would bless the nations. He, he was made a father so that he would be the father of many nations and the spiritual father of all who believe in Jesus Christ. That's why we are going to focus in 2022, folks, on reaching children and young people for Christ. That is our effort this year. Not that we're not going to try to reach adults, but uh, you join me and Brother Cayman in praying that God will show us and will lead us this year in reaching out to children and youth. You see, we have a sacred ob obligation to be involved in missions because it is at the very heart of what we've been called to do. It's the commission that Jesus left us. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's why we exist. God's offer of salvation for, is for everybody. It's for, it's for Israelis and Palestinians. It's for Jews and Arabs. It's for Iraqis and Iranians and North Koreans and Tennesseans and Mississippians. Is that right? Is that right? My mom's a Mississippian. I grew up in Tennessee. But the gospel is for everybody. It's for everybody. And then the final thing that happens, if we seek to, to live not by law but by faith, the impossible becomes the possible. Look, look at what, what happens here. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those who, which do not exist as though they did. How old was Abraham when he had Isaac? He's 100 years old. His wife was 90 years old. What do you say? You say, brother, that's impossible. Amen, it's impossible. But God did it. 
You see, with God, there's no such thing as impossible. Abraham experienced this when he fathered Isaac in his old age. Hebrews talks about it in Hebrews 11, verses 11 and 12. It says, by faith. What? By what? By faith. Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had what? Promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. God did the impossible. You see, there's no greater miracle in all the world than the fact that God has made us alive in His Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation is the greatest miracle of all. God still heals people from cancer and COVID and all this. He uses medicine. But then sometimes God just heals people. You, you, you've heard of it. You've had probably somebody in your family where... They were told, you know, this is it. And they live. God does that. But the greatest miracle of all, folks, is that God can save us in Jesus Christ. And I would say, if, you, if you're a born-again believer today and you've never been immersed, if you've never been baptized, I want to challenge you to take a plunge. I think we may have some folks here. Luke 18, 27. But he said, the things which are Impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, what how do we put faith to how, how to put faith to our faith? If we're justified by faith and not by keeping the law, does that mean that we can just sit back and just passively believe? No. Remember, that was the first premise, Brother Chuck. Believing is active. It always involves acting, the act of leaving. Hebrews 11.8 tells, tells us that. And so we must leave that which we've been trusting in and we must lean on the one who is fully trustworthy and who has done it for us. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. Amen? Well, the first thing you need to do is stop trying and start trusting. In what area of your life in 2022 do you need to trust God in? What area is it? Pinpoint it. Is, is there something that you've given up on, brothers and sisters? It's time to trust that God can bring life out of the lifeless. Maybe it's something going on in your marriage, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's some kind of a ruptured uh, relationship that you are involved in. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's health. Uh, there's all, there's an array of things. Whatever it is, what, what are you not trusting God? What can this year you start trusting God in again that you've given up on? Is there somebody you stopped praying for? You've been praying for five years, whatever. You, don't stop. <laughs> Keep praying for them. There's all kinds of stories of mothers and grandmothers who prayed for their kids for 20 and 30 years before they get saved. Don't give up. It's time to start trusting that God will do His work in His time and His way. And so give whatever that is to God right now and trust Him. The second thing we do is live as an heir. <laughs> what did we sing earlier? I am what? A child of who? I'm a child of the king, Brother Bob. We're children of the king. Live like it. Start living as an heir of God. We ask God to, to bless us, and then we live defeated lives in different areas. That's not right, Brother David. So many verses, Ephesians 2, 3, 2 Peter 1, 3. God's, here's what the Bible says. As His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to glory. And God's given us all things. He's given us all that that we need to live the life that He wants us to live, the, the victorious Christian life. We have all been given an inheritance that is literally, to use the corner phrase that we all, 
it's out of this world. <laughs> Our inheritance, folks, is out of, this, out of this earth, out of this world. And it's time to start living with some joy and peace and claim what's been promised to you. you you have been accepted by Almighty God because of Jesus Christ. You are secure because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. You are significant to the Holy Spirit who wants to use you to glorify Him. I recently heard the story of a young man who was from a very wealthy family. And in that neighborhood... In that neighborhood, the common thing when somebody graduated from high school was they get a new car. Now, this is a wealthy neighborhood. And so the, the young man went out. He found the car that he wanted. He got the price on it, came back, shared that with his dad. On graduation day, his dad went up and gave him a big hug and handed him a, a box about like this. And it said, the Holy Bible. The young man took it, threw it back to his daddy, left, and never talked to his father again. Three years later, after his dad died, from a battle with cancer. His mom asked him to go through some of the things of his father. And you know what he found? He found that box with the Bible. And with tears in his eyes, he opened the box. And he opened that Bible. And there was a cashier's check dated the day of his graduation for the exact amount of money for the car. Folks, God has given us so much in Jesus Christ. It's time for us to not overlook our inheritance. Don't wait until it's too late to recognize what has been given you in Jesus Christ. Discover that today and live for the Lord. A final thing you can do to about this message is if you walk out of this room and you're not sure of your salvation, God forbid, settle the assurance of salvation. Jesus said he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. You, you didn't do anything to earn it. God's grace keeps you from losing it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're, we're, what did Jesus say? No, no man can pluck them out of my father. Once Jesus has got you, he's not going to let you go. He, you know, even the world situation that's unraveling all around us with this COVID and, and our society that seems to be going chaotic and crazy. You can have confidence and be ready because the G, Brother Jim, Jesus is coming back. It's closer today than it's ever been. <laughs> and so we are either... In the end times, or we're getting closer and closer every day. Amen? Amen. The final thing I want to challenge with you, if you, if you want to apply this message, take a risk for Jesus this year, Brother John. Man, let's, all, let's all take a risk for Jesus. What did William Carey, the father of modern day missions, say? Attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. He will never fail you. Do you expect great things from God? Do you wake up every morning and say, Lord, thank you for another day and I, I, I'm just waiting to see what you're going to do today. That's how we ought to. Story is told of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist. In his first trip to England, he sat next to a, a man named Henry Varley and he was challenged by a statement that Varley kept saying. He said, the world has yet to see what God will do with, through, and in, and by the man that's fully consecrated to God. Moody said to Varley, I am that man. And he went on, and God transformed his life and his ministry, and thousands, literally thousands of people were saved through the ministry 
of D.L. Moody, who had never been to seminary. He was self-taught, and he went all over the world sharing the gospel, and thousands of people got saved. Why? Because he was totally committed to the Lord, totally sold out to the Lord. God's calling us in these four areas that I've already mentioned. To gather, are you committed to gather when we're supposed to gather for Bible study, for worship? Grow, we're, we're to gain more disciples, to share Jesus with our network of relationships, we're to grow in depth. Are you ready to give more than you've ever given? Are you ready to get a glimpse of, of the dream that God has for you and for this church? But most of all, I think I want to challenge you today as we close is if you are not a child of Abraham through faith in Jesus, trust in him today. Trust in him today. It's time to make God your father by becoming his child through faith in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me?